OFDM. OFDM stands for orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. And um, basically the idea is that instead of using a big frequency band, you divide into tiny bands. Instead of using a thick wire, use many little tiny wires. Okay. So if you are given a 1 megahertz channel, instead of that you use 10 100 kilohertz channel like this. Okay. And um, then um, the things will be much better using 10 channels than using one channel as it is. All right. And you can see the advantage right away. On a 10 megahertz, 1 megahertz channel, the bits would be very, very small because you are sending at a very high speed. You know, let's say 1 megabit per second. Each bit would be 1 microsecond. On a 10 kilohertz channel, if you do the same thing, same same modulation, everything else, you will get 100 kilobits per second and each bit would be 10 times bigger. Right? Even if the bits run into each other, you will still get most of the bit. Right? Whereas in this case, if the bits run into each other, you are last. And if the bits move by 1 microsecond, you are totally last. Over there with 10 microsecond bits, if you move, if the bits move by 1 microsecond, they are not last. So it's better to have very low speed, lot of them, lots of channels, right? So what you do is you take the band and divide into small pieces and make sure that the power spectrum is such that each channel is running at its maximum. When it is running at its maximum, the other channels are running at, its, at their minimum, right? So there is least interference. Of course, the channels will overflow and there will be some power from the other channels. But this is what the orthogonal part means. Orthogonal means you are perpendicular to each other. You don't affect each other. Okay. And um, so each carrier now can be independently modulated with BPSK, QPSK, 16-com, whatever you want and differently. So each person, for example, if this class were different channels, each could run at its own speed. Somebody is sick means there is a lot of interference. They run slowly. Somebody is, you know, in big speed, they can run fast. So now you have thousands of things which are running at their own speed, at the optimal speed. And um, and so this is used now everywhere. Ever it's ever since its discovery, this is used on the wired networks as well as on the wireless networks. It is used in um, um, DSL, for example. DSL is wired network that comes to your home. It is used in all the wireless networks, including LTE, WiMAX, 82.11, everywhere. And, um, and uh, it is easy to implement using fast Fourier transform and inverse fast Fourier transform. Basically, now we can handle thousands of carriers using FFT chips. Okay, they are called digital signal processing chips, DSP chips. Okay. And so advantages, it is easy to implement. The computation complexity is low uh, compared to the previous method, which was equalization. In the equalization, basically, you know, you wanted to make sure that all the parts of the spectrum were equally interfered with are equally amplified. Um, third thing is, is that graceful degradation of excessive delay. So suppose you decided that the bits would be, you know, 10 microsecond and therefore they can take one or two microsecond of shift. But um, if they shifted more than two, let's say they shifted three, this will not just shut, shut down to zero. It will go down slowly like this. The performance goes down gracefully. It's not just 0 to 1. Robust against frequency selective burst errors. Frequency selective. So at some particular frequency, let's say something comes up, like shown here. Still, you know, it's not being total 0 because there are other bits which are carrying, being carried around. So frequency selective errors are burst errors. All of those frequencies will be gone, but you won't have any problem. Allow, allows adaptive modulation and coding of subcarriers. Now you should know all of these words. I'm just defining these words one by one. Adaptive modulation means that each 
frequency is modulated differently depending upon its own uh, you know interference and thing like that so if there is more interference on this channel on this on this uh, frequency it will be modulated at bpsk this one could be modulated at qpsk this could be modulated at q you know qam and so on and so forth all right adaptive modulation robust against narrow band interference which is actually saying the same thing as frequency select narrow band means you know small band of uh, noise there is some noise happening here so i think this is probably um repeat of that one allows pilot sub carriers so you don't have to use some of these frequencies can be used just for measurement they don't have to be used for data so you can figure out where there is a noise where there is no noise if there is a noise here then the these channels would be modulated differently of course on the channel itself you will find out because they will not pass the crc but even without that you know you have physical layer measurements here which tells you how much noise there is and you can make a decision about you know how to modulate these channels all right so you understand the advantage of ofdm everybody understands what is ofdm it's a big concept and i want to make sure that everybody knows this there is homework right coming up right after this and that one okay any questions about ofdm all right so design so large number of carriers the larger you can have the better you are off but of course it will cost you more because you will need a chip that can handle that many carriers so large number of carriers smaller data rate per carrier and larger symbol duration that's what it means at 10 megabits each bit is 0.1 microsecond at 1 megabit each bit is 1 microsecond and at 1 tenth of a megabit it is you know so on so forth 10 microseconds so the smaller the rate larger the bit in time and therefore if it moves in time because it becomes fatter or it you know comes from a different path for any reason it it affects the bit thick bits are affected less than those tiny bits reduce sub carrier spacing means in so first thing is less inter symbol interference that's important inter symbol interference simply means that the bits run into each other remember that cartoon the bits become bigger and bigger and bigger as they go through and they run into each other and they start affecting each other so that is called inter symbol interference the second thing is inter carrier interference this is different inter carrier difference interference is right here if this carrier puts a lot of power in the red carrier puts a lot of power here in the center area the black carrier will be affected that is inter carrier interference all right and um, due to doppler spread and how does the carrier move as carriers can move in frequency how can they move because of the doppler you are moving so the carrier was actually here but now it appears over here easily implemented as ift ifft and um, and fft is computationally efficient way of computing dft you, you all know probably fft the fall right now it is important to know is that fft is fourier transform and throughout this course you won't have to take a fourier transform so don't worry about it it is very complicated you cannot do it manually you really need computers and uh, so that's okay that's all we need to know right now is that there is a chip that can do it now ofdm to ofdm a dm m stands for multiplexing or modulation um and um, <laughs> multiplexing and then here it is a m a m a stands for multiple access and these are different so we will be using it like fdma and fdm tdma and tdm okay m a stands for multiple access so multiple users okay so if multiple users want to use of we can use ofdm to allow multiple users so what we do is we take a time dimension and the frequency dimension and we can put multiple users in different um, 
different time and frequency domains. For example, user one could get these many frequencies for this much time. And then user two could get here, user three could get all these frequencies for all this time, user four could get here, user five could get there, user six, seven, and so on and so forth. So each user is given a particular time duration interval for which it can use particular set of frequencies. Now this is different than uh, this one. Here we could just give all the frequencies all the frequencies to one user okay and then give all the frequencies to this one user and all the frequencies to third user this would be what tdma time region multiple access if i give all the frequency this frequency for the whole time to one user that is fdma but ofdm is different because in ofdm there are two things happening first of all these frequencies are orthogonal that is why o is there and then we have fdma Actually, actually, it's not really FDMA. This is actually both frequency and the 2D scheduling. So whenever now, from now on, you will start seeing these 2D diagrams. Time, frequency. So whenever we give somebody, we tell them for how long, which frequencies you have. Okay. Previously, you used to have one, one dimensional diagram, either time or frequency and the X axis. Now we'll have both X and Y axis. All right, scalable OFDMA. So symbol, symbol duration depends upon the carrier spacing. So suppose you have carrier spacing of 100 kilohertz, that means each carrier is 100 kilohertz basically um, wide. So here's thing, another thing you have to remember the difference. So the carrier itself might have a frequency of 1 gigahertz. So everything, all the carriers are at 1 gigahertz close to 1 gigahertz, right? But one is 1, one is 1.001, another is 1.002, 1.003 gigahertz, because they're very closely spaced. So the carrier frequency is high, but the width is very small. You understand? So, so here, the sub-carrier, that is called the spacing between the sub-carriers. So if they're very, very close, then the symbol is big. Why it is big? Like, like I explained to you, if you have 10 kilohertz spacing, then it will be, you know, 1 upon 10 kilohertz, kilobits wide, right? So, symbol duration is function of the carrier spacing. Subcarrier spacing is equal to frequency bandwidth divided by the number of subcarriers. If somebody gave you this much band and you divide into 1000, that is the spacing. And so, frequency bandwidth could be 1.2 megahertz, 3.5 megahertz, 5 megahertz, 10 megahertz, 20 megahertz, depending upon the country, you may have that much spacing available to you. Okay, it is different in different countries. The total band. Now, symbol duration affects higher layer operations, so keep the symbol duration constant. So one method is that regardless of what frequency band you get, bandwidth you get, you just keep in every country the same duration, which is 102.9 microsecond. And that means the spacing is 10.94 kilohertz. You can just do one upon that and you get that. And then, and therefore, if you get 1.25, you have only four carriers. If you get twice as much, you get twice as many carriers. If you get four times as much, you get four times as many carriers. The inter-carrier spacing is fixed. Yeah. I'm still not sure I understand how the symbol duration relates to the four carriers. Symbol duration relates to subcarrier spacing. Okay, so basically, if you don't change anything, then the bit is proportional to the hertz. You get the same number of bits per hertz. Right? Mm -hmm. So, the carrier spacing tells you how many hertz you have. If the carrier spacing is 10 kilohertz, then all you have is 10 kilohertz. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, that translates to some number of bits. So, let's say you get one bit per hertz then that translates to 10 kilobits per second. And 10 kilobit per second means each bit is how long? 10 kilobits per second, 10,000 bits per second. Each bit is 1 upon 10,000 seconds, right? So that would be 100 microseconds. Now, if I change that spacing to twice as much, Right? 
So like the different subcarriers will have different, essentially different data rates. Well, okay, hold on. Since they're all equally spaced, if you didn't, if you use the same modulation for all of them, they will have the same data rate. But you could use another dimension, which is different data rates, different modulation. That's an additional factor. Okay, that's an additional factor. You could have different data rates and then they will have different sizes of the symbol, mm -hmm. right? But if you just assume that all of them are at their best or worst or whatever, then all of them will have the same bit duration. And that bit duration, bigger is better. Oh, if the bits are longer, then they are less error prone. Now, can does everybody understand why they are less error prone? Why? Ellie? See, they, they spread. What happens is, remember the delay is spread. You send one bit, one pulse, it comes out as four pulses. Everything that you send so narrow, it becomes this big. Right? So you are sending, let's say, 100 microsecond pulse. By the time it gets here, it is 400 microsecond. Right? Now, if your pulse itself is, now this is a really bad case. If your pulse itself is 100 microsecond and it became 102, let's take that example first, 100 became 102, then if the two pulses merge into each other, there is not a big deal, 98% is still available, right? Mm -hmm. If one microsecond pulse became three microseconds, just two microseconds extra, three microseconds, you can't get anything out of it, right? For the same delay spread, bigger is better. Is that clear to everybody? If you have a question, you know, please ask. All right. So scalability simply means this thing. Scalable means you keep the carrier spacing same. And depending upon the width available, we change the number of carriers. That means it's scalable. Now, this is the new slide that was not there in the old handout. So please throw away the old handout part of this. Make sure that you have the latest one. And I brought a stapler, and like I told you. So anyway, so what is the effect of frequency? So the frequency has a wavelength. Every, every signal has a frequency and a wavelength. They're related. Low frequency means large wavelength. So it's just thinking, think about it. And low frequency means a very tall person. Okay. It can go farther. Low frequencies can go very, very far. They can go 45 miles. The high frequencies have very low bandwidth. They are tiny people. They can't go 45 miles. They can't even go 100 miles, 100 meters sometimes, you know, depending upon the frequency. So everything is related to the wavelength. Right, right, right. So the question you're asking is why do we use high frequency at all? The question is because we don't have low frequency. That's the answer. And I will tell you, you know, basically that's what is happening. So the whole world in the beginning it started with the lowest frequency possible. So most of this communication was at 1 megahertz, 2 megahertz, 30 megahertz. When we didn't leave, when we had nothing left, then we went to 40, 50, 60, 100, 200, 300. We kept on moving to gigahertz. When the gigahertz, when nothing was left, then they moved to 2 gigahertz, 4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz. Now there's nothing left, so we are going to terahertz. We are just using unreclaimed space. I mean, un un unclaimed space. Right? So terahertz is not our first choice, but that's what is available. And this is like bring out some other points. But the first point is higher frequencies have higher attenuation. So the higher the frequency means this lower the wavelength, they go down fast. Okay? And now that is advantageous and that is disadvantageous. One disadvantage is that if you wanted to do a television broadcast, you couldn't do at gigahertz because if you did at gigahertz, you, all the neighbors will have to be, be able to listen, but the people in the server will not be able to get your TV. 
because you know gigahertz doesn't go that far so television traditionally have been at 700 megahertz for that reason because that can go 40 40 45 miles and that's where you know they want they want to be able to at least go that far all right cellular people said okay all right i don't want to go to 45 miles i can i can go less so they were given above 1 gigahertz because they can cover and now they are moving up and up and up yeah is any very okay does anybody know how is the how what is the, the relationship between the frequency and the attenuation we discussed this one so if anybody remembers it it will be good all right i got to take quizzes more often then because if i take a quiz you will remember it and read it so there was a slide, there was a formula where we talked about the received power is equal to transmitted power times something something and there was an f somewhere in that formula right and there was a d in there there was a lambda in there d lambda f if you remember any of that part of that formula anybody remembers that formula for d for, for power of d was 4 i mean we started with 2 and then we said no it is actually 4 but f is squared so basically it is it was um, lambda squared right so it is a squared power not exponential all right so 18 gigahertz has 20 db more than 1.8 you see the ratio is 10 and therefore 10 is equal to 10 db right there plus twice because it is squared it is 20 db okay and then higher frequencies need a smaller antenna now that's another thing is that the size of the antenna is actually ideal size is lambda by 2 so for this frequency you need big antennas like we used to have on the tele for the television outside our house big antenna and so that's not very good for cellular people they don't want you to carry around that big antenna you know with you in your car so they are happy with something which is higher frequency which goes shorter distance and higher frequencies are affected more by weather so the higher the frequency more they are affected by rain and everything else and there are other things such as oxygen molecules and so on and so forth so lower is better and if you go over something then you know then you have to worry about what happens at this particular frequency there might be some other natural phenomena that can affect that so and it's not like a straight line like this it is sometimes like this and people select wherever the least interference is okay so there are many things many frequencies which are not used simply because there is a lot of things happening in the world because of natural things that affect so oxygen molecule is one of them high frequencies have bandwidth have more bandwidth than higher data rate now here's the thing if you go into 10, 30 megahertz all i can give you is one megahertz i mean i can't give you you know 40 gigahertz there at 30 megahertz right but if you go at 60 gigahertz i can give you two gigahertz right so you can get a lot of bandwidth at high frequencies but at the low frequencies the available bandwidth is very low right so that is why they are moving to high frequencies is because now at 60 gigahertz i can use 6 gigahertz and nobody will complain right and i can get 6 gigabits by just doing bpsk right whereas to get 6 gigabit at low frequencies i will have to use really sophisticated coding to get that so high frequencies are good for high throughput high frequencies allow more frequency reuse now all of this has been compiled i had compiled this from many different places this is slide right and at one place i'm presenting it to you so please remember this is all you know very i mean like you know, it's not just available any place i have seen at one in, in one one chapter or one slide okay so high frequencies allow more frequency reuse means because they don't go very far let's say i have very high frequency which goes 10 meters then i can use the same frequency again at another 10 meters I can use the same frequency. On the other hand, if it goes to 45 miles, I can't use that frequency for 45 miles. So, so not going far is good because now I can reuse it again and again. Okay. 
and they attenuate close to cell boundaries and low frequencies propagate very far, so you, you can't do that. Effect of frequencies. Low frequencies have longer reach. We already said that. That means we have longer cell radius. Right? I mean, the television channels are used only for the whole city. You can't use the same frequency again in the same city, which is good for the rural areas. A smaller number of towers, which is good, and longer battery life, because um, longer battery life basically because um, you know the frequency goes very fast. So to send from this uh, this from cell phone a kilometer, you need a lot of power at high frequency. At low frequency, even at low power, it goes very far because there's less attenuation. So power is power is less. It's good. Battery life is good. All right. So lower frequencies require larger antenna and antenna spacing. So if you start using multiple antennas, which I will come in the next slide, then not only the size of the antenna, you see this one, the size of the antenna is larger for the low frequency, right? But also the distance between the antennas has to be larger. Right? If you have two antennas, you can't just put them like close to each other. They have to be, you know, again, lambda by some number four or two or something like that. So, so MIMO is difficult. Multiple antenna is difficult. Low frequencies have a smaller channel width, which we talked about, and therefore need aggressive MCS. MCS means modulation coding. Modulation and coding is you need 256 QAM or 1024 QAM. At high frequencies, you can just be happy with BPS case. Okay. Doppler shift is V times F upon C. High frequencies have high Doppler spread. You see V times F upon C. So it is proportional. The Doppler shift is proportional to the frequency and therefore low Doppler spread at lower frequency. So they are good that way for, you know, you can go at high speed and it still not have that much of Doppler shift. And therefore, you cannot use 60 gigahertz for mobility. You cannot be driving in a car and be using 60 gigahertz. So people have said in practice for mobile applications, for cellular application, we need to keep below 10 gigahertz. All right. So I said so many points are, can just go over all these points and see if everything is clear to you and makes sense. No, because there is only so much available. 30 megahertz, you can't give more than 30 megahertz. At 60 gigahertz, I can give you 6 gigahertz. I mean, like, at higher frequencies, there is so much band. At lower frequencies, there is only so much band. At 30 megahertz, how much can I give you max? At 30 gigahertz? Megahertz. Oh, Okay, so um, so basically, think about this. There is a carrier frequency, right? And that could be 60 cycles for the electric current, could be some megahertz for some transmission, and so, or it could be gigahertz, or it could be terahertz. So there is a continuum of frequencies and there was this chart I had shown in, in the previous module where we showed you what are the different frequencies used for. You remember that chart spectrum allocation? You remember that one? Yeah. Huh? So at low frequencies, the total available is low simply because they are low. I mean, at 30 megahertz, I can't give you, at 30 megahertz, I mean, like 0, 30, and 60, 90. Now, at 30, how much can I give you? I cannot give you 30 to 330. Yeah, okay. I get it. You got it? Yeah. Whereas at 3 gigahertz, I can give you 3 gigahertz and, and nobody will notice because you will get 3 to 6 gigahertz. All right. So that is all. That's the end of this module. 
and path loss increases at a power of 2 to 5.5 bit distance. So, we saw this actually in this model we had d raised to 4 la and we said that the d power is not really fixed. d square can be shown by that 2 ray model, but really it could be 4 is more common. They measured it in the cities and they found that the power of 4 is kind of Fading means changes in the power changes in, as the position, you change the position. As you change the position, the power received changes and there was this weird graph which was along a line. First, it goes down by the line, but then it also along the line, there is a sinusoidal variation. Around the sinusoidal variation, there is a little sinusoidal variation. Remember that graph? That one is basically fading. Personal zones is the idea that whenever you have two antennas, the communication takes place in zones, Fresnel zones, and if there is obstruction in the Fresnel zones, then the signal reduces significantly. So, your antenna has to be at least one such that the first Fresnel zone is above the ground, doesn't touch the ground. So, that ellipse that we had drawn, those ellipses have to be, because you put them too low to the ground, then Fresnel zone touches the ground. Multiple antennas, and we talked about receiver diversity, Transmit diversities, smart antennas, and MIMOs we talked about. And then the OFDM basically splits the band into many orthogonal frequencies, and then you can do both FDMA and TDMA together at the same time in OFDM. You can divide by frequency and time, and you can really put any squares anywhere, any size. Okay? Yeah. Okay, so that's a good question. What is the difference between subcarriers and a carrier? They are one and the same. If we use one carrier, then we call it a carrier. You know, if we use OFDM, then we use thousands of them for the same one is same space, and we call them subcarrier. So these, for example, each this these are subcarriers. But if we were to use this whole thing. In one thing, it will car carrier. Now, having said that, I mean, when we are talking about this subcarrier and we are talking about its modulation, then we might even call it a carrier because each subcarrier is a carrier. It is carrying something, right? Except that it is a part of a big group, so we call it a subcarrier, right? But each carrier, is, each one of them, each of the subcarrier is a carrier. Okay. Okay, yeah, good question. So, what is the size of FFT? So, FFT generally come in power of 2. So, if you take 1000 carriers, subcarriers, then you will need a FFT which can do 1024. Okay, which is the power of 2. If you do, let's say, 1025, then you mostly are likely need 2048 FFT. So, the FFTs only come in powers of 2, so 2 raised to 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, like that you go. And so, you select the large, closest one, FFT chip, or whatever you want to do, right? So, they don't come in odd numbers or any other numbers. Exactly 1024. Yeah. Um, on what causes the sort of the spread of power, the frequencies next to like the main subcarrier frequency? Yeah. So what happens is whenever you transmit a signal, you are not transmitting, you are not transmitting sine waves. If you just transmit one sine wave in the frequency domain, it will just look like a pulse, right? If you transmit a square wave, right, then a square wave is not sine. So what will happen is you, you can express a square wave as a series of sine waves many sine waves, one here, one little there, one little there, one little there, with a different amplitude. 
right? So the power spectrum looks more like this than a pulse, impulse, and the frequency domain. Now this is the frequency domain, frequency and the elemental axis. That's what that's what square waves would, would look like. The square waves will look, I mean, even weirder than this, but that's what, yeah. So this is basically saying that the power is not equally is not just at one frequency. It is you know kind of at the frequency you want plus a little bit more around it. So the frequency spectrum of any signal, any transmission is like this. Basically, it is it is not smooth like this. It could be very weird like that. So it goes into the neighboring places, and and all the licensing requires that you limit your transmission into the neighboring places as much as you can. So when they give you a frequency band, they say this is your band and no more than 5% overflow into the neighbor or whatever, right? Is that something that can be improved? Of course, like of course. The more money you put in, you can just put a filter and then nothing will go beyond that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? But presumably the better you can filter that, the more subject you can have, right? Yeah, right. That's what 1024 is. So basically, that's another thing is that when you, why you cannot have 250, 2048 is because you need lots of filters of that kind, you know, little tiny to make sure that nothing overflows into each other. You need uh, modulators which are very precise, which are very good. You need circuits that do not have any noise. All right. So, homework four. I think you have all submitted one today. Homework four A. Did you get all of them? Okay. So four B and C are now due. B is given the subcarrier spacing and the channel bandwidth. It should be trivial to now. Given the examples I've given, you can find out how many carriers and what is the FFT. In a scalable FDMA system, now in the scalable one, you basically what you do is given upon the channel 10 megahertz is 1024 now you can see what will be for 1.25 megahertz 5 megahertz and 8.75 megahertz you know how many carriers and then you could think about also how many ff what size fft you will need although in most of these systems i don't think they change the fft size they probably sell the same cell phone in all the countries you just don't use that many sub carriers in some countries Right. The idea of a scalable is so that you go to different countries and they have a different size of the band, the rest of the logic works. All right.